The Women's World Hockey Championship begins this Friday in Plymouth, Michigan. And when the puck drops, Team Canada will be without a familiar face. Haley Wickenheiser announced her retirement in January. Over the course of her storied career, she was more than just talented. She changed the perception of what women are capable of in sport. So as she settles into her new life off the ice, we thought this was the perfect time to sit down for a chat. Haley Wickenheiser began skating at age three and playing hockey by the age of five. They just treat me like one of the guys. By 15, she was named to Canada's national team. She's won gold at seven world championships and four Olympic games. She's a two-time MVP of the Olympic tournament and became the first woman to score a goal playing on a men's pro team in Finland. First points for Haley in the first game. Those are the stats, but just as monumental, she has inspired thousands of girls. Consider this. When she was a 15-year-old rookie, there were 16,000 registered female hockey players in Canada. Today, there are 87,000. So it's no surprise, upon retirement, Wickenheiser was honored by the great one. You are the female Gordie Howe. Congratulations. And even singled out by the Prime Minister, who tweeted, you've inspired a generation of hockey players to play hard and dream big. Congrats on an incredible career. I sat down with Haley Wickenheiser recently in Toronto. Haley, so nice to meet you. Yeah, you too, Andy. Thank you. So are you, you getting used to the idea of being retired? <laughs> <laughs> I like to call it graduated. I graduated to, a, to another uh, phase of life, I guess, but uh, it definitely is a different, different life. Why did you decide to quit? Because I, I, I think I read a while ago that, yeah, I'm going to do another Olympics, do another. You're going to keep going for a while? Yeah, yeah, I, I'd wanted to do another Olympics, uh, get to 2018, but there were just so many factors that collided at the same time, and probably the biggest one was the opportunity to go to medical school, which I've always wanted to do since I was a kid. And so I just felt that that combined with other opportunities I have around the game and in business, it was just the right time to walk away if there ever is a right time. It was a tough decision, but uh, hopefully it'll be the right one. So you started at three? Uh, yeah, I started skating when I was three, and I started playing when I was five, and uh, grew up in Shaunavon, Saskatchewan, small town, and my parents were both school teachers, so they were always around the rink. And uh, I asked my dad, watching him play old-timers hockey, he wasn't a, a great hockey player, but he played, and could he build a rink in our backyard? And that's where myself, my younger brother and sister, and all the neighborhood kids learned how to skate was on that outdoor rink. And uh, I was just another body to fill a team at that time, so they were happy to have me. <laughs> Not a lot of girls back then. No, there wasn't. There was just um, myself and my best friend, Danielle, were playing in our little town. And uh, then she kind of got bored and wasn't really into hockey and quit, and I carried on. And so I think for a number of years, I was the only girl in southwest Saskatchewan playing. And I thought I was the only girl in the world because <laughs> I didn't know other girls played hockey until I was about uh, 10, and I watched the, the first Women's World Championships in 1990. That's the first time I knew that women played hockey. It was hard, right, for you? Yeah, it was, you know, when I think back, there were a lot of brutal times. Like, uh, you know, when I think for young girls that are playing on boys' teams now, it's definitely a little bit easier, but it's always um, a bit of an isolating environment. You have to change in your own room. So in small rinks in the middle of Saskatchewan, there was the boiler room or the backseat of the car or the referee's room or the bathroom, wherever I could find a spot. And so um, a lot of moments where parents on the other team would definitely say things or come after me, whether like it was after the game. I had a, a mom once in a little town walk in. I had a makeshift dressing room in the middle of the lobby, and uh, she actually walked right into the dressing room in between periods and told me that I didn't, didn't belong there and I shouldn't be on the ice against her son. And I think I was about 10 years old at the time, and I remember looking at her and just being, not knowing what to say, but, uh, you know, going back out of the ice and just thinking to myself, well, I'll show you, I'll prove you wrong. And uh, you kind of did. Yeah, a little bit, I guess.
Did you disguise yourself? <laughs> uh, no, I pretend you were a boy. <laughs> when I was younger, I think I looked like a little boy. I had short hair, and so you know, and you're a little kid, it, you just blend right in in a way. But you know, when you're 15, 16 years old, I had long hair, and so I would tuck my hair in a ponytail up under my helmet so that my ponytail wasn't showing, and that they hopefully wouldn't figure it out. But um, when you're, you get to that age, you know, there's a, it starts to be a size discrepancy. It doesn't take long to figure out who the girl is, I think, on the ice. But uh, I hope that just my ability would, you know, make up for anything else that was said. So if it was kind of lonely, why did you keep at it? Yeah, it's a good question. I think I just, I love the game. I, I honestly didn't like anything else that went into it to, to prepare for the game and be the only girl on boys' teams. But... I love to play and challenge myself at the highest level I could. I think it's why I went on to play pro men's hockey in Europe was I felt unsafe until I got on the ice and then I actually felt the safest that I could feel as a kid and then um, as an adult playing pro hockey, I felt that you know, you're, you're a player's a player and if you can play, you can play. That was quite something, playing full contact yeah. with, with men. Yeah, yeah. You must have been a little afraid. Uh, I wasn't afraid, but I was always aware. So whether there was a practice or a game situation, I was always hyper aware that at any time I could take a hit that could end my career, that um, I had to change my game, where in the women's game I played more of a physical style. In the men's game I had to find the, the soft spots on the ice and you know, always face the play, never turn my back because you never knew what was coming. Um, but I wouldn't say I was afraid. I was always confident in what I was doing, but I knew that there were days that it was going to hurt. <laughs> Probably everybody in Canada remembers the game in the Sochi, the, la the last Olympics. Um, when the women won, it's kind of one of those classic moments. Yeah. What was it like for you? Well, it was probably the best comeback win in Olympic history, male or female. I mean, you go into a gold medal final, you're down to nothing to your greatest rival ever, and you come back with 10 minutes to go and then win in overtime in the fashion that we did was a little bit of an out-of-body experience. I think we had a lot of puck luck in that game where that puck hits the post and goes wide. If that goes in the net, the game's over. It hits the goal post! And then we get, you know, a, a five-on-four and a six-on-five face-off to score the tying goal. And so just everything kind of worked out the way it could. Fortino rolling puck down low, shot, scores! It's Pula again! Canada wins gold in overtime! But I remember when the, the puck crossed the line, I looked up into the crowd and the first thought that I had was, thank God this is over, because it had been a really long journey to get to that point. And you're more just relieved than anything in those moments to, to finally win and just get the job done. It's kind of gone down in history as one of those hockey moments, along with yeah. all the like the male team moments that everyone remembers. That's pretty special. Yeah, I think that the women's team through the years we've had some really epic uh, sporting moments that will, you know, go down in history as hockey moments, not male or female. And I, I think of the 2002 win in Salt Lake City where we spent 28 out of 60 minutes shorthanded and then ended up winning despite all the odds. And then the Sochi game in 2014. I mean, those are two epic moments in hockey history. Five seconds to go. Four. Broken up by Bottrell. Canada wins the gold on a red letter day in Salt Lake City. One of my favorite moments is you with Don Cherry afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Don says that I got him in some trouble, but uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I look back now, back now and I, I can't even watch it, I just laugh at myself. Haley, have you ever seen any penalties in my life? I've never seen anything like it. It was absolutely atrocious, but you know what? The Americans had our flag on their floor in the dressing room, and now I want to know if they want us to sign it. Oh, we are so happy. Good for you, good for you. I don't really regret it, or I don't wish I never said it, because in the moment, it was just the pure emotion of how I felt, and I think, you know, when I talk to Bobby Clark, he talks about the 72 series and how it was like war, Canada against Russia. And I think for us, in some ways, Canada against the U.S., it's, I wouldn't say it was war, but it was more than just a hockey game for us, especially being in the U.S. and having September 11th and the heightened emotion around the games. And there was a lot going on. And uh, yeah, that was a moment. <laughs>
<laughs> Did the Americans invite you in to sign the flag? <laughs> <laughs> I think a few of them still are talking to me to this day. Yeah, it was, uh, we had played each other eight times before the Olympics and we had lost eight straight. And uh, so going in, no one thought we could win and we were underdogs. And uh, I think just that combined with just all the emotion that goes into winning an Olympics or being at an Olympic Games, I think that was why I said what I said. When you retired, Wayne Gretzky um, said that to him you were like the, the female Gordie Howe. Yeah. Uh, what did you think of that comparison? Well, I, I think it's awesome. I mean, I, anything, anytime Wayne Gretzky says anything, I'm all ears. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, for me it was amazing to have him at the event and to come on the ice. I grew up dreaming to be Wayne and Marc Messier and the Oilers of the 80s, and I tried to do all that they did on the ice. And then, you know, the, the last game, so to speak, there was Wayne standing out there, you know, kind of cheering for me in a way. And so, and for women's hockey, I think it was, it's a big moment. And, and it just shows how far the game has come. This is so special. You've touched so many lives. You've opened so many doors for so many young girls to be able one day to win a gold medal. And to me, that's more important than anything. Congratulations to you. You played with heart, desire, finesse, speed, skill. And the only other person, the greatest player ever lived, I think he'd be happy if I said, you were the female Gordie Howe. Congratulations. Gordie Howe, when he retired a year later, his number was retired. Yeah. Do you think we'll see a woman's number, 22 retired someday? <laughs> I, I have no idea. <laughs> I think uh, the biggest thing for me is, is the legacy of growing the game still and encouraging young girls to keep playing the game. And, but aren't we and there? Isn't it time for a woman's number to be included oh, in that ritual? I, I don't know. Maybe it is. I don't know. It won't be my decision, but if they decide to do it, it would be... You wouldn't say no? No, it would be a huge <laughs> honour, I guess. You would, you would never say no. Well, thanks for all the exciting okay. moments yeah, and good thanks, luck. Mandy. Thank you. Yeah.